Good day to you all, dear ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining our 12th International NIS Conference. And today we have a very special guest right from Canada. He's a speaker, author, advisor, and a researcher. Please welcome director of the Chenin Center from the University of Ottawa. Professor Andy Hargis, please welcome. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, although it is the middle of the night here in uh, Canada, long past my bedtime, I'm uh, delighted to have the chance to uh, address you in this 12th uh, Congress that you've had for research practice uh, connections. I've um, done a lot of work on different things over a long career in universities and uh, before that uh, in uh, teaching. And I've also been uh, very engaged with different groups during this uh, pandemic. Uh, what I'd like to do now is share my screen with you, if that's uh, okay. And um, I'll talk a bit about uh, today's theme. Uh, which is that of how to increase student engagement in our schools in a way that gets beyond uh, relevance, uh, technology, and entertainment. Uh, we, many of us in this pandemic, feel a bit like this picture. We feel like the walls have been closing in. We feel like we're trapped, we feel like there's almost no way out. Uh, but before, hopefully, as we look ahead, we can see little signposts, what we call blazes in uh, North America, uh, indicating that there is light beyond the place uh, that we're in. And if we move in that direction, there is hope for us in the world and in education. How have people been responding to this? Well, in 2020, the OECD, the, who do the international uh, PISA results, uh, talked about the importance, as uh, many political leaders have done, of being back better in a way that is uh, focused on uh, people, uh, that emphasizes the importance of uh, well-being and uh, that addresses inclusiveness and inequality. One of the uh, responses that people have made during this uh, pandemic in terms of thinking what we really need to focus on as children come back to school is what's called learning loss. Now. There's a common sense to this argument, which is during the pandemic, uh, many children uh, weren't able to access uh, online learning. If, if they did, it wasn't very effective uh, for them. Uh, the platforms didn't work uh, well. They found it hard to concentrate uh, sitting in front of a screen all day to be self-directed or self-determined. They may have been in a home environment which was uh, very difficult for learning, um, crowded. Uh, other people engaged in other activities, brothers and sisters involved in uh, learning at home at, at the same time. And when they returned to school under physical distancing, this was challenging too. Uh, learning uh, wearing masks uh, separated from each other, not able to cooperate or interact in the ways that they normally did. And one consequence of this uh, clearly is that there have been all kinds of uh, losses. Uh, students have uh, lost their relationships with their teachers. Uh, they've lost interaction with each other. They've lost the excitement of learning uh, face to face. And they've also lost in some terms in relation to achievement. 
And this has been a major global concern. So organizations like the World Bank, uh, McKinsey and Co., uh, many governments and testing agencies have talked about needing to identify uh, through testing where these losses have been and to make interventions when children go back to school with extra time, extra teaching, after school, weekends, in the holidays, to help the children catch up who've lost the most. And although this seems an obvious argument, there are some difficulties uh, with it. Uh, my colleagues and I writing for the Royal Society of Canada uh, this summer in a report on COVID-19 and schools outlined what some of these difficulties were that are listed on the slide here. First is some students actually made gains rather than losses. Some students with attention deficit disorder found a home they could move around more. Uh, they could fidget more and not be punished uh, by their teacher. Uh, students who found themselves bullied when they were at school were relieved not to be in school and not to be bullied anymore. Uh, some students could learn family activities in, in their family. Uh, they could uh, have more chance to play outdoors uh, with, with other children in a way that they didn't have to the same degree at school. And of course, privileged children learned quite a lot from close support from their parents uh, who had the skills and the knowledge to be able to sit alongside them and help them. So not only did some children lose things, but other children actually raced ahead. The difficulty with thinking about these losses is actually when we start to calculate them in a fairly narrow way, in traditional tested skills of literacy and mathematics, and not in other skills like social and emotional uh, skills, for example, or uh, physical uh, education. And uh, therefore, if we talk about learning loss in relation to testing in basic subjects, uh, the danger is, is that becomes an excuse to retain testing or increase testing and to focus more on uh, basic skills than perhaps we have done before. And the result of that may well be that when children return to school with extra time, extra practice on things that are fairly routine and perhaps even feel boring, that they'll lose their engagement with school, their engagement with learning. And we know during the pandemic, with surveys done by teacher unions across the world, that one of the greatest concerns that teachers have had, and surveys of parents have also shown one of the greatest concerns that parents have had, is that their children will lose engagement with learning. So we don't want to focus too much on learning loss. Uh, children, it's not as if the learning's lost forever. Children will have time to catch up, a grade, a year, two years, uh, three, three years. Uh, we, we mustn't get overly worried about learning loss and start testing and intervening and giving more time and practice that disengages children from school and disengages them from the very idea of learning. So if we aren't going to focus on learning loss, what are we going to focus on? Well, uh, my colleague, Dennis Shirley, and I, who's uh, written a book on student engagement with me, uh, what we say, and I'll show you why in a second, is that what we really need to emphasize now at this time is student engagement. We need to re-engage children with learning uh, who've not been learning or not been learning as well for many months. And sometimes, you know, we need to be engaging children with learning for the very first time. Because surveys in America 
by Gallup poll, for example, show that as they get into and through high school, uh, large numbers of uh, young people, uh, almost 50%, half our young people, say they often feel disengaged from their learning and bored in school. The OECD's data on different countries is not quite so uh, depressing, but even they indicate that between 20 to 40% of young people in high school um, feel that they don't belong and feel disengaged from their school and disengaged from, from their learning. And this is important during and after the pandemic and also before the pandemic, because for most children, engagement is the key to learning. It is possible to learn without being engaged. It is possible to learn by something unpleasant, by just working hard, uh, practicing, uh, sticking your head down and trying to get there to the end. And you can learn some of the time like this. But for children from difficult circumstances, challenging homes, it's extremely hard to focus on learning when other things in your life are distracting you without the learning engaging you in some fundamental sense. So engagement is a kind of key to learning. And on the other side, it's also a window into well-being. If a child is not well, if they're depressed or uh, anxious or angry, then there are re usually two reasons for this. Either there's something going on in their home or their lives or themselves, or there's something not quite right about the teaching and learning in the school and how they're relating to it. So engagement can also be a window. If the kids are disengaged, it can be a window into actual or potential problems with their well-being in school. So as we go through the rest of the presentation, I want you to make this real for yourselves in a way by thinking about a real child or teenager that you know, that you teach or that you have taught, who often seems disengaged from their learning, uh, bored, uh, staring out the window, misbehaving perhaps. What does that disengagement look like? How do they behave as a response? What do you think is causing it? And what would it take to get them re-engaged in their schools over time. So as we go through the rest of this presentation in the remaining 30 minutes, it will be helpful if you have a picture of this child in your head and everything that I talk about, keep thinking of them and see how what I'm saying might make you start to see them in a different way as we go through the presentation. Uh, Dennis Shirley and I have written uh, two books that are coming out in the last few months. The first one I talked about in the keynote and that in the plenary, that is well-being in schools. And the other one is a book that came out a few months ago called Five Paths of Engagement. Uh, why did we write a book on student engagement? Well, the reason is, is that we were working on a project with rural schools in the northwest of the United States in five different states. Uh, they had received a grant from the government, these five states, to improve achievement in poor rural communities. And the way they planned to do this was by networking the schools together, reducing their isolation and enabling teachers to develop their professional capital with one another as a community, sharing ideas, working on things together 
and giving each other moral support. And because I've had a lot of experience with different countries helping them build uh, effective networks, uh, this uh, project asked myself and uh, Professor Shirley if we'd work with them and help them build their network. One of the things that networks need to, fo to do is to decide what they will focus on. And many other things they have to do, decide how big they will be, how small, who will be in it, who will be out, how they'll make it sustainable, all these things. But one of the questions is how is what the network will focus on, what they will do. And the educators in the network decided that they wanted their focus in terms of trying to raise student achievement to be on student engagement. They believed from their practice that if students were engaged with their learning, with their communities, and with their plans for their life beyond school, then, especially when they lived in challenging circumstances, they'd be more likely to experience success. So Dennis Shirley and I followed the schools in terms of their focus on engagement. It wasn't our idea, it was their idea. But because we were paid to support them, we watched them uh, together when they met, online when they met, and in their own schools as they tried to develop projects together that engage their students more fully in their learning and their communities and in their lives. And we also did a lot of reading on student engagement. There's a big literature on student engagement already and to see how we could connect that to what the teachers were doing in their schools. And from this reading, we came across some interesting results. The first, the overwhelming one, was that almost all the literature is in the field of psychology. Now, the work on psychology tells us some important things. Uh, most of it says there are three psychological dimensions of student engagement. Actually, we now feel there are more. But the psychological literature, which is pretty consistent, says to be engaged, you have to be engaged emotionally. You have to feel passionate about what you're doing, excited ab about, uh, what, about what you're doing. I say it has to arouse your feelings about the things that you're studying. And secondly, there has to be cognitive engagement. You have to be interested. You have to be curious. You have to be able to focus and to concentrate and to develop your understanding. And thirdly is behavioral engagement. We saw a lot of problems with this during the pandemic. Um, are, you, are you there? Are you not there? Are you, can you stay awake? Uh, are you hungry? Are you keeping your eyes on the teacher and, uh, and focusing? So does your behavior reflect engagement as well? All these three elements together are important. We, we also found there are other elements. For instance, we think there's spiritual engagement. Spiritual engagement is how learning um, really arouses in you a feeling that you're connected to something important that is bigger than yourself. And that relates also to what we might call moral engagement. And moral engagement is the feeling that there's a, a purpose that matters for you in your life that your learning can help you fulfill. But the psychological literature focused on, on these three. It, it also has, from psychology, we also have some 
uh, well-known uh, theories about different parts of engagement that are widely used in many schools. And I'm just going to very quickly uh, go through a number that we highlight in the book. These may be uh, familiar to you. So there is, for instance, uh, Abraham Maslow's a hierarchy of needs. And in the hierarchy of needs, people often talk about the bottom of Maslow's uh, pyramid, uh, the need for safety, the need for security, food, water, warmth and rest. It's hard to be engaged if you don't have these basics at the bottom of the pyramid. But, but at the top, Maslow also talked about uh, self-fulfillment, self-actualization, self-fulfillment. And indeed, after he spent time living with a Canadian indigenous community, he talked about self-transcendence, which is the, the feeling that you are not only fulfilling yourself, but your, your learning is somehow enabling you to move beyond yourself and your own needs, to connect with the needs of others uh, around you. So Maslow is very important in terms of student engagement. And then also in the 1940s, a man called Harry Harlow uh, did famous experiments with the uh, monkeys that uh, tried to find out what made them attached or not to images of their mother. He developed uh, theories, the first theories of maternal attachment and maternal deprivation. Along the way, he also developed experiments with monkeys to see if they could solve puzzles and what kinds of rewards of food would enable them or make them willing to try and solve those puzzles that he placed in front of them. But on the way, accidentally, he discovered that very often the reward had no effect on how they solved the puzzle. What motivated them was how interesting the puzzle was in itself. And this led him to create the concept of what we now know as intrinsic motivation, the inherent attraction of some learning or task or project that will keep students engaged with it over time rather than a test score or a grade or even the teacher's praise. Then uh, thirdly, there is uh, the work of uh, different groups of people on the concept of, uh, of mastery. Mastery, uh, we, we talk about master's degrees, we talk about master classes, uh, we talk about being a master baker. Mastery is about accomplishing something that is difficult and that is also of interest and of relevance to you. And that sense of mastery comes not only from having the knowledge and becoming very capable at it, but it involves a psychological challenge to the self that in mastering a thing at a very high level, you also, in a way, become the master of yourself at the same time. So a third popular theory is the theory of mastery. So there are others, uh, and we, we go through several of them within, within the book. But you might want to think about when you have experienced self-actualization or self-transcendence. When you have experienced intrinsic motivation when you have experienced mastery and then and then flip your thinking to think how often do my students experience intrinsic motivation in what they're learning and how do i create that how often do they like olympic athletes or great musicians feel that they've achieved true mastery in accomplishing something that initially they felt was too hard for them 
and that was beyond them? And how did you help them do that? These are some of the popular theories from psychology that have influenced a lot of practice within our schools. But psychology doesn't always have the answer to student engagement. And indeed, if you go to the handbook of student engagement, where pretty much all the papers are psychological in nature, you'll find it is not only one of the most uninteresting books you've ever read, uh, one of the most disengaging books you've ever read, strangely, but you'll also find that the articles in there are based so much on experiments with student volunteers or metadata or large surveys that, that they give little insight into what actually goes on in classrooms between teachers and students that promotes or inhibits deeper engagement for them. So to get that wider perspective, we need to move from psychology into other disciplines, and particularly sociology, which is my training and my background. And when we do that, when we begin to ask some critical questions about engagement, we find that there are three myths we need to be aware of. And I'll just quickly go through these before I open the door to what five paths of engagement can really offer us. The first is, does engagement have to be relevant? Does some people often think this is the magic bullet in a way for engagement? If we can only make the things we're asking our students to study relevant to their lives, relevant to their interests, surely then, they will be engaged. And often this is true, and I'll come back to it towards the end. But there are three questions we have to ask about this that are important. The first is, what exactly does it mean to be relevant? So, for instance, uh, my granddaughters, who were seven years old, had their birthday, their twins, they had their birthday last week, and one of the presents they received was about the science of making nail varnish. Now, this is science, and it's making nail varnish, which is relevant to them as girls. But are we also stereotyping what their identity is or their interests are as girls? Are we starting to shape their identity as girls as we begin to do that. So how do we choose in a way or define what is actually relevant? The second is, is that um, one of our jobs as teachers is to follow students' interests. This is how we usually think of relevance. But surely also our job is also to introduce students to new interests. Think of an interest that you have and I bet often it was a teacher who introduced you to that interest in the first place. So learning doesn't always have to be relevant to what students are already interested. It can also introduce those students to new interests that become relevant to them over time. And thirdly, does learning always have to be relevant to projects, to it, uh, projects like uh, immigration or climate change that are very serious and profound and important, of course. But if this is the case, how is it that students get engaged when they're watching the movie Frozen or reading the novels about Harry Potter, for example? which are entirely about imagination and creativity and seem to have no relevance at all. So relevance can be one path into engagement, but not the only path by any means. Second, and I talked more about this yesterday, does technology always have to be 
engaging? Is technology the answer? Is more digital the answer to getting kids engaged rather than sitting in rows and listening to the teacher all the time? Well, uh, what we found in our work in Ontario in Canada when we observed uh, teachers in 10 uh, school districts uh, trying to bring the government's uh, agenda into being in their classrooms. We saw many exciting projects going on in those schools, on wildlife habitat, on uh, playing a garage band, and, and, and learning how to play musical instruments, on uh, typing and editing letters to government officials, on uh, studying, charting, graphing, uh, uh, changing pollution levels on um, studying child labor practices in different uh, parts of the world and accessing the information to do that. Digital here certainly helped uh, improve innovation and increase engagement in many cases. But this wasn't always the case. And at the same time, uh, at the same time, although teachers would say things like, you can hear a pin drop when they're uh, researching, or you never see them bored or off track when they're learning in this way. Other people, like teachers of young children or mental health specialists, say they, they worry, I won't read these quotes in detail, but they worry that they find a lot of kids are at home playing video games, whereas the teachers would rather see them interacting with each other around uh, activities uh, together. They've seen schools try to introduce uh, iPads or other devices all at once in a class and discovered that it created chaos over an entire year for that class. They learned less rather than learning more uh, because of digital. And the mental health specialist at the bottom uh, was worried that uh, as children were spending more and more time on screens in school and out of school, there were more explosive behaviors, less ability to sit down, more inability to cope because they were spending too much time on screens and not enough time in other activities. So with technology, there's a yin and a yang, uh, which is it really can enhance innovation but it, an engagement, but it can also raise serious problems for student engagement at the same time. And the third uh, myth is that does learning always have to be entertaining? Does it have to be fun? Is, is the main goal of engagement happiness or joy? Well, of course it is some of the time, but especially when we're after mastery, Learning is not always entertaining. Climbing a mountain in pouring rain is not always full, but when you well, fun, but when you get to the top, you feel fantastic. Training to be a marathon runner is not always fun, but the sense of accomplishment when you achieve it is incredibly uh, fulfilling. Uh, learning to move to a new level in mathematical understanding can be exactly the same, but exhilarating once you've broken through. Now, this doesn't mean that we should make learning miserable or not change or improve how we do our teaching, but it does mean it's in the nature of engaging learning that not all of it will be fun. Some of it will be difficult and challenging. So some of it will even make you suffer. And the job of the teacher is to help you through that so you'll develop that sense of true accomplishment at the end. So these are three myths of engagement. What then are the pathways to engagement that we did discover in our schools and through the small amount and through the sociological literature that we studied, not about engagement as such, but about what shapes a human conduct.
So the first is uh, creativity and, uh, you know, the work of the German sociologist Max Weber in the 1920s said that when the Chinese invented examinations two centuries ago and bureaucracy two centuries ago, it had a good intention. And bureaucracy, they said, is a good thing. You get a job according to your merits, not according to who's in your family. You are promoted based on your achievements, not based on your uh, connections. There's when you have bureaucracy, you have no bullying in the workplace. You have no corruption in the organization. Bureaucracy can be a good thing. But the problem, Max Faber said, is often bureaucracies became constraining. They turned into an iron cage that limited people. And this is what often happens in our secondary schools with too many examinations, too many tests, and too much content in the curriculum. They steal the magic from teaching. They steal the magic from teaching and learning. They disenchant young people. And we need to get that magic back. This is my colleague, Dennis Shirley, uh, learning marimba music alongside some students in one of the schools that were in our project in the Pacific Northwest. So one of the first ways to develop student engagement, one of the, one of the five pathways that we talk about is, is infusing more creativity and magic into learning and into the curriculum, not just in the early years, but all through high school and even in the ways we interact and have meetings as adults within the schools too. A second, uh, here I am in a school in the Pacific Northwest whose economy had collapsed. And there's an indigenous community that is part of the school, uh, an Aboriginal community. And uh, there is also a, a working class community that has lost their jobs. Together here, you can see the children and I focusing on the dissection of salmon, but not as a boring clinical exercise in a laboratory like many biological dissections are, but rather the salmon is connected to the indigenous heritage of the Aboriginal community. It's a fundamental part of who they are. And it's also seen as being the future of the economy in the nearby river, which will develop uh, fishing and tourism. It brings together two communities. It brings together the future and the past. It connects learning to something that has a meaning and purpose for those students, for their identities, for their future employment, and for the communities that they belong to. Which parts of your curriculum truly have meaning and purpose? If I come and ask your students, what are you studying? And why are you studying it? Especially why are you studying it? Even square roots or quadratic equations. Can they tell me other than simply saying, I'm studying it to pass an examination? Third is we need to develop senses of attachment and belonging in our schools. Uh, we know that many incidents of violence in schools in the West occur because students have no sense of belonging to other students around them. They feel bullied. They feel excluded. They feel as if they're not the same as the other students around them. How do we build those senses of attachment and belonging in our school community, not just in sports or in theater, but in the way we learn cooperatively in our classrooms, in learning with people who are different from us 
as well as ones who are the same. Different identities, different personalities, different belief systems, perhaps. How do you actively build attachment and belonging as a way to engage students, not just in after school, but in your school as part of the teaching and learning? A fourth is teachers don't like to be told what to do by bureaucrats from above. And students don't always like to be told what they have to learn as if it's arbitrary and they have no choice. How much choice and voice do you give your students in the life of the school? Here's a school that has, like all other schools, um, a mental health issues within the school. And one way the school addresses it is it has a mental health committee of students. And the students on that mental health committee have problems with their own well-being. But they're exactly the ones who need to be on that committee. And here's a poster they've produced of 50 ways to take a break when you're feeling stressed. What voice or choice do students in your school have over what they study and how they study it? In these schools, students with disabilities with special needs are taught about their special need. They're taught about famous people who have their special need but are very accomplished. And they're taught to advocate to the teacher what conditions they need to help them learn better in the classroom because of their special need. What voice and choice do your students have? And last of all, we come back to the issue of focus and mastery. Our students in high school have many distractions. Uh, they're teenagers. They get excited uh, easily. Uh, they uh, become interested in social and peer activities. More and more spend a lot of time on their iPhones being digitally uh, distracted. So how do you build that sense of mastery by really helping them focus? Here's uh, two students in an isolated community in the far north of uh, Alaska in North America where it costs a fortune to fly in food from other places. They are building a hydroponics kit, uh, growing local vegetables by greenhousing them and forcing their growth. They're building a kit as a way to start to think about how to grow food sustainably in their own communities. The topic is relevant. It's interesting, and you can see they're clearly very focused in mastering the skills and the knowledge of what they have to do. So this is what I've tried to talk about with you today. Before the pan, during the pandemic, many students became disengaged from their learning. But even before the pandemic, up to half of our students in high school were already disengaged from their learning. There's an epidemic of adolescent boredom going through our schools around the world. The way to address this is not to focus too much on learning loss, on testing and the basic skills and making interventions in uh, routine exercises after school or at weekends that will simply disengage our students even more. The answer is to get our students learning and to get them loving learning and reconnected to learning through what we've seen as five key pathways to increase their engagement. Creativity and magic, meaning and purpose, attachment and belonging, voice and choice, and focus and mastery. Think again about the student that you had in your mind at the beginning 
and their disengagement. Which of these five pathways is most likely to get them re-engaged with their learning, re-engaged with their schools, and re-engaged with the life that lays ahead of them? Thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you very much, Professor Hargreaves. Uh, uh, nice to meet you today. A very interesting presentation. And uh, I think one of the most important uh, topics nowadays around the world, not only in Kazakhstan or Canada, I think everywhere, it's a very important uh, point about the fulfillment, uh, engagement, and also disengagement is uh, one of the main problems nowadays after the pandemic. And uh, thank you very much for participating for our conference. Uh, very glad, very uh, happy to have a conversation with you. Uh, and for, for guests who want to read the books of our professor, uh, you have a website, www.andyhagris.com. You right. can visit this website and find more information about these topics and uh, find your books, I think, yes? Yes, you can. So, uh, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for what are you doing right now and uh, through the whole your life. Uh, and uh, I I'm happy to uh, finish our our lecture, our session. Thank you very much, all the guests that yeah. participated in our conversation and our yeah. session. Goodbye, everyone, and now I must go to sleep. Okay. Yeah. Have a nice okay. sleep. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.